Welcome to the AI Assisted Organization podcast, hosted by myself, Piers Linney, and my co-host and co-founder of Implement AI, Dr. Alok Shukla. Hi, Piers. Well, it's good to see you in Lisbon. I'm finally made it to Lisbon. It was good indeed. Like you got to see Lisbon, made up with Sam, see different things around, and like, yeah, no, it was it was, it was really good. So if you're listening to the podcast, watching us, a lot of our team and Alot lives in Lisbon and we've uh, Sam, one of our sales uh, leads, is based there as well. So we're spending more time out there. It was uh, it was the first time in Portugal, to be honest with you, which is quite shocking. Anyway, um, so that we were traveling so much last week and we're, we're doing various events you probably saw in our social media Elite um, keynotes, uh, Elite Business Live, the tech show. I did a uh, business innovation show, the entrepreneur oh. competitions, two of those bit chaotic so we kind of um missed out on a pod last week but we're gonna we are gonna try and get these done on sundays and then we record them and then get them out by tuesday yeah. so we're gonna try and stick to that in, in the future uh time goes very very quickly so again our show this podcast is about ai for business so yeah some of this does overlap with some news what's interesting but we want to help you sort of understand and embrace artificial intelligence and implement it in your business or as a business owner or a senior leader in terms of your personal life and how you can use it to enhance yourself yeah. and the theme this week again we've been kind of going back to basics uh, since since the beginning of the year and the one we've been talking about quite a lot the last few days is training so training yourself training your team the business upskilling your team upskilling. Upskilling. Um, and, un and understanding training isn't it in terms of how you go about it what you should be thinking about and uh and how in, in this world whether it's training, whether it's implementing AI, these are not projects, these are not one-offs. This is now continuous. Yeah. It's a change of mindset. Exactly. And it's just like when you hire people into your company, you're adding new capabilities. So upskilling your team with AI is adding new capabilities into your team without increasing your team. So we're going to be going through that in more detail this, in this episode. So we've got two weeks of news, really, but we're, we're, I've got to focus it down on what we think is really particularly interesting and, again, relevant to business. And one is, which, again, it, it might be relevant to your business directly, but... The ability to code using natural language and to avoid an enormous development team is going to democratize access to you know the, the software development it's going to reduce a lot of the cost i've been through millions of pounds over the years in development some okay. which works some doesn't and there was a, a thing called it's called cognition ai and they announced a great fanfare they did a good job of it to be fair there are others but this this got a bit of uh, traction in the media it was devin so Devin is a, a software engineer, an AI software engineer, and what they're kind of saying and what, the, what people thought, and actually, if you, see the, if you see the example, you never quite know with these videos as to how good it really is. But what it looks like is it's possible that it can do coding, it can actually do a, it can spot bugs, it's, it can actually do architecture. It's actually a really, really powerful sort of coding copilot, if you want to call it that, an engineer. And this is kind of, again, is, is the next step, the next phase in moving towards this world that Jensen Huang was talking about a couple of weeks ago where yeah. code goes away, okay? You just talk to machines and they they give you, you give them inputs, you give them ideas and they generate an output, which might be a software, could be a user interface. You tweak it in actual language until it does what you want it to. And that seems to be coming a lot faster than we thought it did. So this one has gone beyond just passing basic coding uh, benchmarks. It can do planning, coding, debugging. It can deploy projects, uh, testing. It can have, do its own QA. So really quite interesting. Uh, it can do, it, it's got its own command line. It's got its own code editor. It's got its own browser. So they've really thought about this in terms of building it in. And again, as we always say, AI is the worst today it's ever going to be. Yeah. Devin's amazing, but there'll be another Devin in, in a month, which is even better. And again, it's an exponential curve. There's, there's no real, I don't see any slowdown into development of this. And the big thing here to talk about, look, I think is not really what Devin does. It's just this, this movement towards the democratization of, of access to software development. Yeah, it's it's basically the first AI team member, right? Let's call it that, because like you've got the evolution of like you know the the AI the auto completion for like part of coding. Then you've got like the copilot that's doing certain parts for you. Then you've potentially got like a an, a, a co a, like you know an, an employee or a team member which will do stuff for you. And and Devin that that company's got some quite interesting backers, like the guys from from Stripe and from other ones. And that's why they got a lot of PR and fanfare because of what they were able to do. But really, I think the key thing here is that like it's able to do things autonomously. And it was even completing some jobs on Upwork, basically. Like it could even do certain tasks and things like this. So definitely very interesting. And all code over time has just been more and more abstraction. Like you went from machine code 
to different languages which would basically simplify different elements to it than to other languages which then had frameworks and libraries which simplified other elements to it and we're just moving further and further towards like you said natural language basically to be able to describe what you want it's quite it's quite interesting it must be quite disruptive on you know your upworks because this is what a lot of people around the world do so now you don't you won't need to go to upwork you'll just have your own code copilot just, just sitting there waiting for you and even within teams right like if, if, if you've got like before like the teams that would need to be hired to create like a software as a service product or a, a new tech startup you would have like you know five engineers six engineers different things like this you'd have the junior engineer the senior engineer well now this will kind of take the role of some of the juniors and different things like this so even like the cost structure the team structure all these things are going to change it's going to make the more expert ones more useful because they can check and understand everything that's going on. But it's like we're seeing in all industries, the junior ones that don't really know what's going on and their work is on a par with these AI tools, they're gonna to struggle. I mean, I was, we were paying, um, you know, in the UK, 60,000 pounds a year for someone who's two years out of university. That, yeah. You know, the need, the needs actually quite um, a lot of support. Think about just coding like code. and stuff like that, right? You know, like how, how useful or valuable are those skills sometimes basically, isn't it, right? You're gonna to have to become very, very good to have a differentiator. So it's the big one to keep around. It, it means if you're in business, it means that developing applications, um, the cost of it's going gonna, it's gonna to tend towards zero over time, which is good news for all of us. Another big one, which again, it is relevant to business, it's a little bit further out, is uh, robotics. So you've probably seen that robotics, you know, this has come and gone quite a few times. We've had lots of false dawns over time. But I think this this might be the, the real dawn. Yeah. And you're not quite there yet, but you are going to see you know, again, an exponential world, whatever you think it's going to be, you probably have it, you know, robots working in warehouses. So the one that caught our attention was a uh, figure AI. That's and this it. essentially is a, an, a sort of a humanoid looking robot, although it's on wheels, I think. Um, and it's got basically chat GPT in it, essentially open, open AI GPT, I think it was four or 3.5 turbo, I'm not sure which one. Um, and essentially all it is, is an embodied chat GPT. And the point here is, is that you know, these days, these specialist models that are designed to do one thing are kind of going away. These generalist models are becoming incredibly powerful. And once they're embodied in a, a humanoid looking robot, or whatever form factor needs to be, that has that sort of dexterity, can pick up things and move things. They become very powerful very quickly. Now, the machine itself is still incredibly expensive, but is anything as it scales up as the production costs go down, these things have become cheaper and cheaper. And what you're seeing is, um, organizations starting to try this. So it's quite interesting. You saw Mercedes are now deploying humanoid um, robots and all that, and they're doing what they call low skill tasks. So they are taking um, I think components and then transporting them over to human workers on the assembly line. So you will see large companies try this already. Another big piece of news was NVIDIA. We're gonna come back to NVIDIA later. They've got a, a, new, a sort of a model essentially for robotics called Groot. And this is a game changer as well in terms of its training. So it's a generalist model, but not a generalist kind of LLM model. It's a generalist model for robotics. Uh, so you're seeing that the world where the economics of you purchasing a robot, do something in your warehouse, as opposed to employing a human, is probably whatever we thought it was. I've always said it's like five, ten years out. You can probably halve it. I mean, imagine, imagine it's like 60 grand, for example, right? Like like a car price or something like this, like, and you finance that over five years or three years or whatever that on lease finance, you know, the, the monthly figure is like, you know, it starts to change quite dramatically, isn't it, right? You know, and then you think about like how, like the, in the example that you saw um, from that video, basically the, the robot was standing in front of like a kitchen counter and then the person just asked him, pass me something I can eat from the table and it passed the apple and it even explained that's the only thing you could eat basically because it's the only thing that's edible. So I think the key thing here is like these systems are become very, very good and it's not far to imagine where it would be picking and placing in an Amazon warehouse because already you've got those robots which bring the boxes to the picker and placer, you know, like to actually pick out the box and stick it on in, into the into the um, carton for the, for Amazon. So it's not going to be far before all these things happen because they've already got computer vision built into it and everything. So I, I think, like you said, like embodied AI, like these kind of like physical workers, it's it's coming quick. But it's, it's also the the point really here is, is that, um, you know, ro robotics generally, it, we talk about these sort of humanoid form factors and there's a real battle about who, who wins there, but that's just probably not going to be the form factor that wins that. And also you were talking there about, you know, you buy one and finance it over five years. Can you imagine the software updates over five years? No robot is going to have a, a probably a, 
a useful life of five years. There might be three. You'll have an enormous amount of sort of capability up upgrade in terms of its software and maybe some of its hardware as well. But that's the issue is that robotics, once it starts to tend towards the point where it's affordable for most organizations that need sort of physical labor, you're going to see the change very, very quickly. So I think it's really exciting. Let's move on from robots though. So one of the big things we've all been talking about ever since it was announced was Sora. So Sora was OpenAI's uh, text to video model. So pretty short prompt. You get beautiful 60 second, uh, almost uh, HD video. Looks like sort yeah. of movie quality. So that's going to be launched apparently later this year. We never quite know when it is. Um, we're going to talk about Sam Altman a bit later, but maybe that's GPT 4.5, who knows? Uh, and also it's going to have sound. So one of the things that sort of struck me when I was using it is, and, and, when, and I actually made a short video giving some examples, and I actually... Uh, added the sound myself, some sound effects, like going through, it was flying through a museum, I did kind of like a quiet museum art gallery sort of background sound. But you're going to have sound built in, which makes it even more powerful. Mid Journey have also now getting into the game. So they've announced that they're going to be uh, launching text to video as well. And Mid Journey's image generation is, is fantastic. So we get to see what their video is like. So by the end of this year, the point we're making here is you're going to be able to access these platforms so generate 60 second you know movie quality videos of any scene you want to it's march now and this is stuff is already happening right you know like so imagine like three months from now six months from now exactly like you're saying right and it's this ai arms race that we all benefit from like you know sora releases something then you know mid journey releases something then uh, google <laughs> deep going to release something so i think they're also all timing this with the election i think whoever whoever comes out with something first for the us basically you know like i think that's one of the biggest considerations as well you know being able to like, generate all this video very quickly but i mean the, the tools are very powerful and then moving on, some, some of the news which I think is relevant in terms of sometimes thinking, people often ask us, what should I use? Or, you know, what, what's the best? Who, who do you, which model do you trust or company? Now, the point is that these companies are growing very quickly. They're raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Or billions. And already, we're seeing yeah, billions in some cases, and already we're seeing consolidation. We're seeing some of the, the sort of weaker players being sort of weeded out. Some have run into sort of got, you know, gone down cul-de-sacs. So you've seen, I mean, it's quite big news. If you saw my um, my book week recommendation, it was The Coming Wave by Mustafa Suleiman. Yeah. He's one of the co-founders of Google DeepMind. He then left Google, went on to start Inflection AI with uh, Reid Hoffman, who's the, the founder of, um, he sold it to Microsoft, of LinkedIn. And then... I've talked about some of our podcasts, maybe last year about Pi, this sort of personal agent. But I probably mentioned that I couldn't really see why you'd want a personal agent, the EQ, doesn't have all the kind of IQ. We talked about this last week as well. Anyway, cut, cut the long story short. Although they've raised hundreds of millions, yeah. Microsoft have now acquired the team. Have they raised billions it or was, hundreds of millions? A billion was a billion. So, so okay, so it's definitely a unicorn, right? So it's been going for probably a year. So Microsoft have acquired the team. <laughs> But Stafford Solomon's left. He's now going to be running the Microsoft AI unit, a bit like the, the Google DeepMind within Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, they're going to the co-pilot unit, they're going to call it. The investors are being made whole because they're going to, they've done some licensing deal where they're paying $650 million. So investors don't lose their money. They get probably what they got back and keep the equity. They'll pivot it to do something else. It's bonkers. I mean, this is still very easy to do because, you know, Reid Hoffman happens to be on the board of Microsoft. So they all they all go down to the local sort of wine bar and have a chat and come up with a deal like that. But it, it, it's insane. So you're now seeing that um, that these companies that were set up, you know, and raised billions, that they very quickly realise that they're pointing in the wrong direction and something needs to happen. But you've also seen, um, looking here, that Apple have acquired another company, Darwin AI. We won't go into detail what it does. Well, Apple are probably the on the quiet have been the most acquisitive company at AI. It's when Apple. We mentioned this before, when Apple do come out of the gates with their AI strategy, which will be transformative if you think about the distribution of their devices, it's going to be something uh, pretty special, I would say. I would like to think, otherwise the share price is going to take a massive hit. And the other news is the um, Stability AI, one of the co founder guy called uh, Emad Mustak, or Mustak is it? He's leaving there, but that's been rumblings for a few months about his his role there. He's leaving there to go and pursue decentralized AI, which seems to be um, his thing. Because, and this company now is now pivoting to try and make money. And the yeah. problem is here is that 
open source companies, AI company. If you want to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah, that's fine. But they want the money back and they want a return yeah. on it. They're yeah. not going to get it. Yeah, by 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 innovating, uh, spending hundreds of millions in R and D, then open sourcing everything. Um, so I think you're sort of seeing in some ways that reality is beginning to bite that. And we saw this at OpenAI, didn't we? And the, and the uh, Elon Musk um, yeah. um, sort of sued them over a similar issue. So you see now the, that people are going to realize that if you're going to need this amount of capital to make this stuff work, then you got to start making some money. Uh, and if you if if they can see that. That's not happening. Or, or use about option. it very quickly. Exactly. Because the thing, is, the, the thing is here, we, we, now that we're in this exponential age, in this AI assisted age, everything moves much faster. Remember like how fast like ChatGPT got to 100 million users, okay? So the whole point here is that like, if you, in the, with these AI tools and with, these, with, the, with the right AI propositions, they generate value quickly. So the thing is, if you're not able to actually like start helping people discover the potential and those people aren't telling more people and they're not referring and you're not going to get in seeing large user growth or large revenue growth or whatever like that then basically yeah, i mean, I mean we, we, we both we can probably guess we both can guess that nobody was interested in pi no matter what you said about it how you used it you just didn't see the reason to have I mean, mid journey track mid journey too. versus pi right you know that like people have been using mid journey but they have been like getting more and more user adoption for example right but if pi has not been getting user adoption or even stability if people are not paying like i think they introduced their 20 dollars a month um subscription to try and like have have a different example that we discussed that a few months ago but if people aren't subscribing to that you, you know that you have to change because basically like we talked about before with the ai bullet train like if you are still on the station and your and your train has not left, you can't catch up. Basically, so what no. we're starting to see is these accelerated cycles within the within the industry for consolidation, for abandonment, for pivoting, and I think all those things are just going to be better for business owners because you get access to better tools. Well, but also, uh, I think there's a another point is that with my M and A hat on now is that this is kind of the foundation. It's almost like the tech stack. You're yes. starting with you know the kind of the semiconductors, then you're going to have the chips, then you're going to have the cloud, then the LLMs. And I think you've seen this happen there. But eventually, as organizations implement this technology and you start to see, you know, the AI leaders beat the laggards, you're going to see this kind of M&A activity happen very quickly on the commercial stage as well. I mean, Apple, for example, like everyone's got an iPhone pretty much. Like, so if they come up with a good strategy that will help that for the personal AI and stuff like this, for the Siri that was promised that never happened, that all makes sense. For Microsoft, oh my God, I can't, like no one's gonna, no one can beat these guys now. Like they're just doubling down, doubling down and, and they're growing even faster with enterprise adoption. Google, like I signed up for like the the, the studio and it, there's, it takes time to actually even get through that stuff. So they're gonna kind of have challenges when it kind of comes, comes into some of these different areas with some of the new models. But I think that like, we're starting to see who's winning and who's gonna start, you know, increasing their lead quite soon. Let's move on there. So just very quickly, Elon Musk, uh, as kind of open source grok we had there's another no, there's another grok we're going to talk about it's not the same grok so this is his um his large language model essentially and he's kind of because basically they've open sourced the weights of architecture it's 314 billion parameters that's the kind of size of it and they've open sourced the raw model pre the fine tuning the training they did on the model so you're getting the kind of the, the raw components you have to go and fine tune it for your particular use case but you know he, he kind of said that he's doing what he said he was going to do. But once again, the the training, the weights where you're actually used, using the Grok, say on Twitter, um, is going to be quite different to what's been open source because that value again is is what the investment's gone into, what's been captured. And it, people don't, can't give it all away because how are you going to raise more money? It's the same issue, I think. The people, they, they talk a good game, but... It's a lot of narrative. I think it's also a lot of like virtue signaling, like, you know, like, oh, we're open source, we're this, that. Well, people actually just want tools that work and work at a high standard. And it's like no different to anything else. Things that work at high standard and are robust require investment. They require training. They require adaptation and, and curation. But there is this whole vocal kind of like um, signaling, virtue signaling thing that needs to happen as well, basically, you know, so. So moving on then. So if you use uh, YouTube, we do a little bit. Um, you're going to have to now sort of um, tag your videos if they've got AI generated content, which essentially is a human saying or doing something like deep faking, for example, something that they didn't do in real life. So it's going to be a bit like, um, you know, you, when you upload YouTube, it'll say, is this for children or the different oh, okay. boxes you check and you just check one of those. So that's something you need to be aware of as well. Um, but what, what I can't fully understand is, is that if it like copyright on YouTube, like they can, they, they know 
what's been copyrighted, they can check and they do it very well. But if a deep fake video is very, very good, how's YouTube going to know? I mean, total question that, but I, I don't see how they're going to capture it. So I think it's going to be very, very hard to police. Yep. Right, moving on. Sam Altman, uh, if you if you don't listen to the Lex Fridman podcast, if there's one worth listening to, yeah. if you're interested in AI, it's this one. So it's Lex Fridman. Very he used to be we started to be called the AI podcast. Now it's probably one of the best podcasts out there, to be quite frank. And he had Sam Altman on uh, and had a conversation. It's worth listening to. Cover a lot of ground. You know all the sort of rigmarole that went on at OpenAI, which is kind of interesting. Maybe, maybe went not. Straight into that. But things like AGI, how far away is AGI, uh, GPT five timing, what they may launch before GPT five in terms of a GPT kind of four and a half. So and you know the power struggles and the competition because it, it does it does impact the market as a whole. And now you're seeing that you know that one of the biggest um, investors and backers of OpenAI has now just acquired Inflection AI. So yeah. it, you're seeing this consolidation and all these these sort of brains and people and know-how uh, coming together. No, and, and and in that in that podcast, it's very interesting because you actually see him like really almost like um, dismissing GPT four as like you know not very good and all that kind of stuff. So you you know something quite. I know. Right. He was saying that. He was kind of saying that, oh, you know, it sucks. I could kind it's of not very good. It's yeah, it kind of sucks almost. It's kind of yeah. basic. But, but, but he, he has to kind of take that approach, isn't it? Right. Like, uh, it's like, uh, it, it reminds me of a Bruce Lee quote. Like, someone says, like, people ask me, like, how, how, how good are you? And he goes, if I say I'm really good, you think I'm bragging. If I say I'm not, you know, I'm lying, basically. Right. Like, so in the same way, like, he, he can't be like digging up GPT for too much. But very clearly, from what, what they've been saying, you can see that some very powerful capabilities are coming and they just recently filed some patents for voice assistants and different things like this so i think they're going to come up with some very powerful stuff later on this year but but yeah i mean i think it's very clear to see that more and more tasks are coming and he had this very nice thing which he talked about in that video which um i talked about on linkedin like you know the way to think about ai is like what percentage of five second tasks five minute tasks five hour tasks and five day tasks can ai do and there are a lot of those ones basically because if you look at sora that might have been five days of like editing you know animation motion graphics all that kind of stuff or five hour tasks it could be like you know compiling creating presentations research different documents even scientific papers that they've got like now they're being published by ai and, and a few people got caught out for that you know so I, I definitely see that like all these things are coming and it's very good to see how the leaders who already know the you know the product strategy and the future stuff coming you see how they're reacting to stuff so you can kind of think to yourself like okay you need to get start implementing right now basically you know yeah, so definitely definitely worth a, a watch or listen uh, nvidia moving on so nvidia huge announcements so i'm going to go for all you can watch the videos if you really really want to but it's essentially the co-founder well the founder ceo of nvidia on stage waving around gpus <laughs> i mean it makes me laugh it's like launching a new washing machine you've got it's like steve jobs but I mean, Steve Jobs had a, had a product, a phone, and or an, an iPod. He just waving around GP. bits of computers. It, it makes me laugh. However, said what doesn't make me laugh is the fact that the new GPUs, the Blackwell, they're 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 thirty thousand dollars each, something ridiculous like that. So you can imagine now they're thirty thousand dollars each, and every single large language model AI player will be putting in an order for thousands of them, quite literally. Yeah. But these are twenty five times. Um, and more efficient in terms of the uh, lower cost to run, which is quite amazing because these things are really, really quite uh, power hungry. Uh, and what you're seeing again, again, going back to our exponential curve, you're seeing that already, I mean, every year when they have these uh, annual sort of launch um, um, conferences, there's something which is fundamentally better than what they had last year. Yeah. And, and what make, what's interesting is that you know, all these companies are spending billions literally on ordering these chips, and then suddenly yeah. they launch one that's better. And exactly. And then they also have like they put the pre almost like pre order, pre reserve. And then it's like they've all pre ordered, but whoever gets like ahead of the queue, the rest of the other ones, they're all like bidding on each other, basically. Well, you've got the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. What was it? A $40 billion fund they've just set up to invest in this stuff. Just sitting there with their checkbook. How, how many can I put you down for? It's insane. Um, so, I mean, I don't give financial advice, but. I don't think that's thing. Our stock's still got somewhere to go. Yes. And they've also launched, just a quick aside, a digital twin of Earth to how it's called an Earth 2 cloud platform, which is basically, um, which is quite amazing, actually. So it's a digital twin of Earth. It's got all these weather patterns, and they're trying to predict weather using their sort of compute power Honestly, to avoid the, natural it, disasters. Those guys, like, really saw this coming a long time ago. And, you know, fair play to them. Like, I, I really like Jensen Huang. I, I like some of his talks and stuff like that. And I mentioned that as well. I'm an investor in a company called Sen, 
plug for UK space tech company where they essentially put they launched a satellite this week. This is the UK company launched satellite. They're putting cameras on the ISS pointed down at Earth. So you can see that some of that data, this huge amount of data, can be absorbed by a platform like um, NVIDIA's. And I think they're actually talking to them. And then the other Grok, moving on, there's another Grok, a Grok with a Q. So this is, um, they're making, I think they call them LPUs, not GPUs. So think of it as more of a specialist GPU. So it's faster and even more powerful. So what Jensen Wang's waving around, Grok are trying to create more powerful versions. So they've got faster inference against processing them, speeds. I wouldn't bet. No. Um, but <laughs> these, the, the, we've seen some of these, haven't we, where we've been used in um, like voice agents where the time it takes for it to respond is, is a little bit faster, makes it feel a little bit more human. So again, what's interesting in this world is, and if you listen to the Sam Altman, Lex Fidman podcast as well, is that in other ones, you don't really know whether the large language model and the GPU, they're all the rage now, but whether they're going to be, I'm showing my age now, the Betamax of the video wars, you know, Betamax versus VHS. Uh, so we just don't know. These might be things that are great today, but something better comes along. Yeah, but I think like fundamentally, like we, you, you're buying intelligence as a service. And so like in, 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 it's all about like at what price point and at what speed and um, performance ratio, how much AI will we use for intelligence? Because like if it's fast and it's cheap, we'll use it for everything basically, right? Like, and I think everything's moving that way. And, and because a lot of this is abstracted where they're buying their massive data centers and maybe they upgrade to, you know, NVIDIA's new chips or whatever like this, but they don't really care because they know that like if they can get, you know, half the price or half the, or, or double the throughput um, at a different price, then they can quadruple the amount of you know people that they can offer something to because part of the thing they haven't really saw yet is they don't have the compute available you like, like literally like they can't release it because the number oh, of people it'd be, it'd be a killer I mean, it's always not going to be cheap but that's the whole point right like but once they've got those kind of like the processing capacity available for these things you know from nvidia's new stuff or everyone else's new stuff it's going to come and like you know compute is going to be the new the new thing basically and actually, will. that's what um, Sam Altman says, is that the currency of the future is will be compute, essentially. Yes. Now, this doesn't really matter to most people running a business, because what we're talking about the edge case here, the, the kind of cutting, bleeding edge. For what you need today, you need to game, to most businesses, game. is already available. Yes, and um, you need to get in the game, basically, because then you can upgrade your... Um, capabilities over time. We're going to we're going to go into that a bit more detail. Yeah. So quickly, a bit about what we do. If you don't know yet, so uh, we're kind of revisiting our training. It's been going quite well. Our training academy, but we're going to be changing that slightly in terms of building courses where you can sort of get more value over a long period of time. And we're going to talk about training in our theme this week because it's it's actually really really important. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. You can download resources from our a resource um, center as well. Uh, if you're thinking about, I'm just about to, uh, I've just been drafting a white paper actually about if you're in a business and you want, you're this kind of AI champion or we call them AI advocates and you want to, you might be the CEO, right? But no one's listening to you. You might be someone who's quite junior and new to a business, but you see the potential. You also see the threats in terms of comp competitive threats and you want to be the advocate for AI in your organization. We're building a white, writing a white paper to help you do that. If you're kind of a senior leadership team, you want leveling up. We do things called AI boardroom briefings. They're very popular. So we kind of come in and level up the whole team. So you kind of understand what AI is, how it works, how it impacts your sector, how you should think about it, the threats, the opportunities. And then you can make better informed decisions about what your next steps are in terms of implementing AI. And then a lot of, most of our clients start with AI Activate, 60 day program. It kind of covers everything. So think of us really as your outsourced AI innovators, um, SEAL Team 6 team that are going to come in and help your company understand this stuff and start to implement it and build a plan for the future. That's what AI Activate kind of does in a nutshell. Right, let's move on. So upskilling and your team with training. So, I mean, Alan, we talk about training a lot, don't we, where, you know, AI about implementing AI, one part of it is, you know, your policies, your governance, you know, the actual proof of concepts, MVPs, agents doing stuff. But people miss quite often is that, Training is the first step to creating two things. One is getting the maximum value from, from your investment in artificial intelligence, even if that's Microsoft Copilot. Um, that's three things actually. One is upskilling your team and augmenting your team so that they do, do more meaningful work. And as I always say, why is anyone that's good gonna work for a company that doesn't use AI to empower them to automate the mundane and, and the admin as well? 
And the last thing really is, is that, you know, training is really, it is, it is absolutely the first step in unlocking AI by making sure that people understand that the output you get from a lot of these platforms is only as good as the input. Absolutely. So let's start, right? Like uh, you want, when you want to upskill your team, like bringing AI into your company basically means adding a whole new set of capabilities. Normally when you, when a company wants to add more capabilities, it would hire more people to increase the skill set or to increase the capacity of, of certain functions, right? Now you need to think about bringing AI into your company in the same way to add new capabilities. So almost like AI team members that can help do different things that you couldn't do before. We'll go into a bit more detail or adding capacity. So it, rather than adding another person into a department, helping that department use AI so they can increase their productivity. So they could do the equivalent of if there was three people, they could do five people's work or six people's work, something like this. So let's look at that. What you want to do is you really want to have access to a good training program where you've got different outcomes. But really, you're going to have to think about having someone as the AI training lead in your company, the AI lead, the AI advocate, the person who's passionate about AI within your company and is going to help you almost like get more stuff done within your company. And if we think about like adding new capabilities, let's have a little look at what this could be, because basically all companies have the same sort of functions, marketing, sales, operations, you know, R&D, finance, all those sorts of things. But let's talk about this. We, we talk with many companies and many business owners, and they just don't have the budget to, you know, to hire more people. So let's think about if you have the right upskilling and then you AI capabilities added into your company, what could you do with that? So let's start with, for example, marketing. If you've got the right capabilities and the right skills, your team could actually be able to create AI avatars of you, which could then speak in different languages or even explain different elements. You could even add, you know, customized onboarding for your team members. And it could even be like sales follow up emails where it's like, you know, hi, peers, you know, thanks for downloading our white paper or hi, peers. Thanks for, you know, opting in. Here's more information. So all those different things to help build trust within that. So what we call that is like an AI content studio, be able to create more interactive, personalized, engaging content within that. So really, you want to make sure that you're training program and your skill acquisition means that you can create more pieces of content from video, you know, white papers, you know, short form for, for um, posts on LinkedIn and then Facebook and social media, and also, you know, more, more, you know, deeper, deeper dive stuff like research and different elements like within there, basically, you know, it's, you want to be able to like have an AI content studio within your business. So before we go to the next part, anything you want to add in on that part, Piers? Well, I think it depends where your business is, um, like content's one, but the point really is, is that you need to have a, a kind of a baseline. Yep. So most people, they're not leveled up. So in an organization, the disparity between people's understanding of AI uh, to people that are really into it, but even though they don't have to, even, though, even then they don't have to put it in a business, those have no clue is, is enormous. There's a real asymmetry. So you've got to kind of, I think, have a baseline. And then based on your organization, what Alan was just saying is that, fine well where can you add the most value what really matters to your business you know growth cost optimization content and then you start to train people um, with particular skill sets to optimize their ability to implement ai into their part of the business their division their department whatever you call it yeah you're right so like so the first bit is the ai mindset basically isn't it right so that's for people to be able to even understand what is possible in this ai world and and not be afraid of it so fear yeah. uncertainty of that is the more so the two things the more people understand it the more they and experiment with realize, it. yeah realize how it can help them now you do get a, sl a slight flip to that side to that coin which is people start to realize oh hang on a minute it can do a lot of what i do but the mindset is is that i the human your employer colleague needs to think about moving up that kind of value pyramid to add more value do more interesting work and let let the stuff they've they've always done because they've had to let the, the, the AIs do that because it's not really adding a lot of value. And like, there's so many things that you can do specifically. Like, for example, if, imagine you've got like an email follow-up campaign and you've got like a sequence of emails and you've already got the data within your CRM of like, what's the open rate based on the subject line? What's the photo look like in the email? What's the content? You know, you can set up the e the AI system in, in the right way if you know how to do it with prompt engineering and, and the right skill set that it could actually act as almost like a senior marketing consultant. It could give you different subject lines for each of those emails based on your customer avatar. And it could also suggest different images for you based on the email. So it could actually help you, you know, create new content to improve your conversion rate. And it could even then monitor what's going on with different things. So there's a lot of skills, a lot of value you can do within there. So that's like talking like within the marketing and those different elements of it. So absolutely like Pierce said, the mindset comes first, then it's like what concrete outputs can you do like is there you know 
more content you want to do? Is there some contracts you're using that you could supplement and do in different ways? So that's like one part of it. The other part of it is within your company operations. So if you think about your meetings, are you recording your meetings, your knowledge base, your training, your you know, new, new employee onboarding, your HR, your recruitment, all these different areas, how can you use AI for the meeting notes? How can you use AI to be able to like, you know, streamline and um, researching candidates and analyzing their different outputs? There's all these systems. So again, if your team members have the skills to do that, they can almost build out departments, which are almost like one person to into onto more people. So I think it's important to have these different skills because many people want to have different consultants that will help their business, but they can't afford it. But this is the way where you can almost have either AI employees or AI consultants in different areas for the function that you're trying to do, basically. Yeah, so the first step really is, is that in these tools is learning how to use and depending on depending on where where it matters to you but there isn't there isn't a single company i don't care if it's a, if you're a sole proprietor that cannot use this technology in some way yeah. to improve your chances of success or if you're already successful to improve your margins and your profitability there just there isn't an organization out there that, that doesn't cannot use this technology and the first step i will say is, is that it's, it's avoiding garbage in garbage out so a lot of the initial we we'll talk about microsoft copilot briefly you know a lot of this is prompt engineering now that might not mean anything to some people but it's been able to write if you're talking about a chatbot let's call it a chatbot write the prompt the text you're sending into that ai to get the response you want if you don't know what you're doing then it's going to be short you won't provide the context and you'll get frustrated and you'll stop using it if you know how, how to prompt what context to provide and how to sort of iterate over time to get the answer you want how to break down tasks to write documents for example you'll get a much better outcome and you'll 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 surface and realize the power of it and you and your colleagues are more likely to use it more often to extract the maximum value Copilot is a great example, okay? Yeah. A lot of what it's doing, really, in generative AI, there's a clue in the name, generative. It's good at generating content. It's prompt-based, okay? You're seeing prompts in every single, you know, Microsoft productivity suite uh, application. If you don't know how to prompt, then for that, you know, you're paying up front now for a year's license. You're not going to extract the most, the maximum value you can from the application. No, exactly. And I think the key thing here is like making sure that you both have the, the mindset and the skills within the company of how to do it, but then also setting up the tools in the right way. So it's got the right prompts, the right systems, the, the, the right workflows, because there's quite a lot of customization you can do with Copilot to be able to do things. But just moving on with other things that people might not realize, like people don't realize that like some people in the company are searching for different things. They might keep a track of six different competitor websites, or they might keep a track of six different supplier websites. If you have AI set up in the right way, you could actually have systems set up which would research those things for you and help you understand when price changes happen or different things happen. There's a lot of competitive advantages that you can actually unlock within your business. And I think if you don't know what you don't know, that's actually a risk for you, basically. And I think it's important to make sure that you've got the ability to at least understand one, what are all the things possible with AI that you could benefit from within your company, whether it's, you know, you know, procurement or whether it's recruitment, whether it's content creation, whether it's operations, whether it's even risk management, for example. Right. You know, like a, even like if you're dealing with, let's say, you know, difficult situations with employees where you're, you know, there might be something quite contentious being able to, you know, have like almost like a chaperone digitally attend that meeting with you to be able to understand how things are going. All these things can be very helpful and very useful for businesses. And at the same time, even consulting, like even like how to critique your website, how to critique your landing page, how to give you feedback on what can be done. There's so many different areas that can be done with it. And this brings to the second point, continuity. You need to constantly understand where things are and as new capabilities are added in, how you can use them. For example, we mm -hmm. talk about using Claude for some things or GPT-4 for some things or using GPT-3.5 Turbo or 4.5 Turbo or even Gemini, for example, within law firms or with different companies, depending on your particular need, how much document you need to go through, what kind of knowledge base you require, there are different systems you'll need to know. And the thing is, the difference between there's that story, isn't it? If you need to cut down a tree, you'd spend the first hour sharpening an axe. So if you've got the right tool and the right sharp axe, you can chop that tree down very quickly. But if you're using an inefficient tool and you didn't realize there's a better way to do something or a way to create your own AI workflow that can link a few steps together, because there are those as well, you might be wasting a lot of time, basically. And I think that's the key thing, constantly upgrading and have a continual approach to your AI training, basically. I think well, this is a general mindset shift, right? And this is for any organization. Again, sole proprietor to multinational is that 
technology is no longer a project. You're not, you know, you're not building a website. You're not putting in a new CRM. You're not, I don't know, transition into the cloud. You haven't, you haven't done it yet. This is going to be constant. You are going to be constantly having to reinvent and, and look at what's, what's possible. Look at what the competition is doing, how they're using the technology and make sure that you're at least on par and ideally ahead of them so that you don't fall behind very quickly because you can fall behind incredibly quickly. If you think about your competition starts to use the technology in ways in which you haven't thought of yet or just can't be bothered to do, they're very quickly going to, uh, not only are they going to win when it comes to new customers, they're going to start taking your customers as well. So it's whether it's technology, whether it's training, it's going to be a constant, constant process. And that, for most organizations, especially smaller ones, is a mindset shift because often you don't have that kind of training constant R&D budget. That line isn't sitting there in your uh, sort of in your forecast. But the lost productivity is there, basically, like in, in, in what you didn't gain from. But it's like your phone, right? How often do you upgrade the iOS on your phone or the operating system on your phone? Like they get pushed all the time, right? And at the same time, people also upgrade their physical device as well when they've got new capabilities out there. So it's a, a, adapting to this kind of new cycle. But the thing is nowadays, you're being able to add in whole new capabilities and whole new functions, which you couldn't do before, basically. So I think the key thing there is like, you've got the continuous approach to do it. You also need to like have specialist roles and advanced training. So you might want to deep dive into particular areas. So imagine, for example, um, data is a very important area within your organization. So you might be doing a deep dive in like, okay, what are the, all the ways that we could have, like not just um, our own team able to understand the data in, in plain language, like maybe having an AI agent system where you can ask in plain English and it will look things up for you and do complex SQL queries and stuff like this. Maybe you also want to have AI agents which just monitor things for you and only flag to you where there are exceptions or different areas. Maybe you have a system which is monitoring all your LinkedIn posts and it's seeing like how, what kind of engagement are you getting? How are things working from there? So there are areas where you'll do deeper dives. So like, as Pierre said, everyone in your team needs to have the mindset. You also need to have foundational level skills, but you also want to have deep expertise in the key areas where it's important because you want to have deeper dives on the training in, in those zones, basically. And there are many different zones that you can do this to go deeper. So you can almost build out entire teams from within there, basically. And then the other thing then is having that practical implementation and support structure. So we work with many companies almost literally as that, like where their support structures, they got questions, they can come to us, they can ask us. And that's that's one of the benefits of being on these programs. You don't waste time. You're able to actually like progress and move forward. Yeah. And I think, again, going back to talent, if people who are work, who you want to work for you, if they're not seeing this sort of uh, support, they're probably not going to come and work for you. The people who are working for you are going to, over time, want you to make, train them so they can automate the mundane, but they're, they're, they're being upskilled as well. Um, so we think training is, is fundamental. Um, so you, so the last thing I would say really is is the, the, the implementation of any support structure. So it's very, very hard for organizations to, to, to do what you are trying to do anyway, like keep changing it, to do what you, to do what you, doing anyway, um, and then start to implement your know, training programs, uh, AI implementation. Kind of the bandwidth. That, that, that's, what, that's what we do. Exactly. There's quite a lot there uh, on training. We are going to be, um, as we said, um, publishing some white papers on if you're an AI advocate, how to help you. We've got a big one on the whole kind of process as well, uh, but we want to sort of help you champion this technology in your organization, no matter how senior you are, even if you're the you know, the boss, the CEO, the founder, or a very, very senior manager, you often need help. And, and, and there are ways in which to do this. And it's not like uh, a lot of previous sort of technology adoption uh, cycles. This is quite a different one because it's going to be permanent. It's a permanent shift. So our AI of the week, uh, this is this is one we've been looking at again because it, they had a few issues. But it is really worth going and because we talk about open AI and chat GPT, we talk about Claw quite a lot. Is, is to go and have a play with Google Gemini. So it's a Google Gemini Ultra model, but the product's called Advance. And just go and see, it's, it's multimodal, built from the ground up. And just go and play with the, the Google stack as well. And again, if you, I mean, it's quite hard, you can get a, I think it's a two month free, is it two months or three months? A two month free subscription. And go and compare it to your, the same inputs and outputs you're getting from the other models. Um, because again, these models are sort of, Tripping, tripping over each other in terms of their development. Yeah. Claw's probably ahead of the game now, but you are going to see, as Sam Altman mentioned, as we mentioned earlier, a chat GPT 4.5 or something that's going to come out pre-chat GPT 5. And again, they're not going to launch that, 
unless they can show clearly that it beats, say, Claude Pro in the benchmarks. But definitely worth going to have a play with the, the, the Google uh, version to see what you think of that and how that works for you. So that's kind of it. We've gone over a bit a bit more time there. We had a bit more, a few more things to fill out. So download our white papers. Please sign up for AI Inside the newsletter. If you want to talk AI, if you want assistance with understanding the technology and implementing your business, get in touch with us. Um, and we will see you next week. We'll try and get this out for Tuesdays. Um, and we look forward to talking to you and helping you implement AI again. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Thank you.